like to welcome everybody to, uh, to this event. I'm uh, John Muscadari. I'm the scientific director uh, for the uh, Canadian Frailty uh, Network. And we're really pleased um, to, to uh, put on this event with, uh, with our partners here in, uh, in New Brunswick. And with us, we're, this is, we're gonna have an online co uh, component, uh, the in-person component. It is so nice to see people uh, in person again, having conversations after a big, uh, a long two-year delay and us being able to, to socially interact in person. Zoom just does not cut it in, in, in that regard. And we're really pleased with the wide variety of attendees uh, that we have uh, today. Uh, we have uh, uh, research, uh, we have organizations working in aging, we have researchers, we have health care and social uh, uh, care workers, we have organizations and people from home and long-term care, we have uh, people working in age tech, uh, older adults and caregivers who are attending, and uh, so we're really, really pleased with uh, with the attendance. And hopefully, it'll be a very interactive uh, day. It'll be great to uh, to make uh, new connections, to rekindle old uh, connections that have maybe lagged over the the past uh, two years. To put on this conference, uh, we. Um, we uh, partnered uh, with, uh, uh, with a lot of organizations in, in uh, New Brunswick to make this really applicable to, to the local uh, care, uh, care system. And we wanted to highlight innovations, uh, research, knowledge translation, and people that were doing innovative things and putting them into practice to improve the care for people, uh, for, for older adults. Uh, the presentations today, were selected through a competitive process to ensure that everybody had a fair uh, chance at uh, presenting. We had a lot of uh, a lot of uh, demand, and the, all the proposals were reviewed and ranked by the planning committee. Uh, to put together an event uh, this big uh, takes a lot of work, and I'd like to to thank uh, some of the people in the audience. First of all, I'd like to. Uh, to thank Leah Carr, who is uh, the Director in Programs and Human Resources uh, from the New Brunswick Health Research uh, Foundation. Leah, is, uh, is it back there? Maybe, Leah, I can have you stand. Hey. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Justine Henry, who's the Executive Director for the Center for Innovation, Innovation and Research in Aging. Is Justine uh, in the audience? Hello, thank you. Uh, Jane, Jane Brecken, uh, Breckenridge, uh, Deputy Director of Monitoring Evaluation Knowledge Transfer Units at New Brunswick Institute for Research, Data and Training. Jane. Uh, Danielle Kent, uh, the Research Coordinator for Locke, Lom and Villa. Uh, April English, uh, the Knowledge Transfer Office Monitoring Evaluation Knowledge Transfer Unit, also at the New Brunswick Institute for Research uh, Data and Training. Erin Jackson, Coordinator Collaborative for Health, Aging and uh, Care. And finally, I'd like to thank the, the CFN team, which is uh, Brittany Lester, who uh, couldn't be here today, unfortunately, because of COVID, Matt LeBranche and Carol Berry. I think they're somewhere in the audience uh, too, but they've done the yeoman's work in, in getting all, all this uh, together. And finally, we have um, from uh, the, the Canadian Frailty Network board, we have members who have traveled from across Canada to attend and members of our research management committee. This was a great opportunity to get together and, uh, and uh, see people in person uh, after a long leg. So I'd like to thank all, all of them for, for attending with us uh, today. And now we come to the exciting part of my uh, my presentation, which is the housekeeping that I know you've been, you've just been waiting to, to hear about. Um, so the first thing is that because this is a virtual in-person event, we'd like to keep it uh, 
um, um, the room as quiet as possible during uh, the presentation so everyone virtually can hear. We'd like to keep it on time as much as possible. Um, all the speakers will be given a bit of a reminder towards the end uh, with a little sign saying how much time they left. And all the speakers before they, they come up here, if they could uh, meet at the, uh, at the tech table to just to, uh, to ensure that everything is organized. Um, the exhibits and demos will be open uh, during breaks and, and lunch and also from 5, 30, uh, to, from 5 to 6.30 this afternoon. Um, and uh, speakers will be available to ask questions for the online attendees. Um, you can uh, feel free to contact the speakers by email. We would ask that, um, that just to keep the event as safe as possible, um, that uh, any time, besides when you're eating or, uh, or drinking, please uh, wear a mask as much as possible during the, the course of the day. Um, always the important announcements about the washrooms. They're, lo they're just outside uh, the ballroom hall, down the hall. Um, door prizes will be drawn uh, uh, during the presentation event, event and as well during the 5 to 6.30, uh, uh, the 6.30 reception. Uh, you have to be here to, to get the door prize. So it's a way of keeping people uh, waiting to, to, to see if they've won the door prize. Um, the dietary restrictions have been, commun uh, have been communicated uh, to, to the staff. If you have any questions, please uh, uh, ask uh, the Delta staff members uh, about the diets. And finally, I, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Kelly Lamarock, who is the uh, New Brunswick Child and Youth and Seniors Advocate. Um, and I'm really looking forward uh, to the talk. Um, Mr. Lamrock really has a very, very uh, varied career, and I hope I can make a bit of, uh, do a bit of justice to it uh, since it's so, it's, uh, so uh, varied. Uh, Mr. Lamrock uh, completed his education in, in New Brunswick. He's been a longtime resident of New Brunswick, and he's done uh, uh, really a lot of things, including have a legal practice, uh, being a commentator on CBC television, uh, working for the New Brunswick Healthcare uh, Healthcare Association, Director of Student Affairs at St. Thomas University. He was an MLA for two terms and had a variety of uh, senior uh, positions. And he's got a really uh, uh, varied uh, policy work, including on government uh, poverty reduction, on education for kids, and has done a lot of work internationally too, a lot of uh, focusing on improving uh, democratic institutions. Um, and he, um, uh, he was a, a appointed uh, to this role uh, in, in the set, I think he started in February. And uh, so it was relatively new, although in three months, uh, probably it may be interesting to get his, uh, his take on, on everything. And finally, the most interesting part of the, of the resume is that uh, uh, Mr. Lamrock is an enthusiastic amateur actor and, and has won numerous awards for stand-up comedy. So I look, <laughs> so I look forward uh, to that. So uh, with a warm welcome, of, uh, warm welcome to Mr. Lamrock, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Bon matin, tout le monde. C'est bien d'être ici très tôt dans mon mandat quand on a des des années à New Brunswick. It's really nice to be here. And I, it was a very kind introduction. He's told you the important part, which is I'm 52 and I haven't been able to hold down a job. So that's, <laughs> that's largely true. I asked you to look past that this morning. Um, as you know, one interesting thing about being the seniors advocate, uh, that mandate for seniors and vulnerable adults was added to the existing child and youth job description uh, just only a few years ago. The interesting thing about being an advocate is not only does our office provide ombud services in resolving individual issues, but we can go a little further. We can look beyond the individual issues and ask more important structural questions. We can push government on policy. We can make recommendations. In other words, we don't just pull people out of the river, we travel upstream and can ask, why are so many people falling in the river in the first place? And that mandate is important when you largely speak for groups who are sometimes on the margins 
of society. Children, of course, lack formal power. Seniors often are, particularly those we speak for, may, be may not have the institutional power because they're reliant on government for services. And we try and be a voice who enters into the democratic process. We can't make anybody do anything. The elected people do that. But we can make sure, in the words of Lord Wilberforce in the British Parliament, he said, I, whatever you choose to do, you can no longer say you don't know. And the work of my predecessors, Ben Ali Shah and Norm Basse, has been to bring important issues to light publicly so that the discussion has to happen. And that's something we're committed to do. Notre équipe est ici, je vois, et on a une bonne, bonne équipe des gens avec beaucoup de passion pour aider les gens qui ont besoin de d'assistance et je vous encourage de apprendre un peu plus de notre bureau. I just want to start by, there's really two topics here today. One is seniors, but the other is innovation. And I, I hope to marry the two a bit. When I was uh, director of student affairs at St. Thomas, we discovered that uh, student stress levels during exam time went through the roof. And there was an incredible burden on counseling services, an incredible burden on mental health professionals, and an increase in episodes in residence. And for a long time, there was a lot of discussion on what is the intervention, the infrastructure, the training we might need to lower that. Might surprise you what one of the best answers was. Puppies. It was puppies. Um, puppies and home-baked cookies. Apparently, if you set up a room full of puppies and invite stressed out students to play with the puppies, stress levels begin to decline. Hot chocolate and cookies go a long way. That's not to minimize the issue of mental health services or to say that access isn't important, but sometimes it is the small issue, the thing that would be noticed if you're right on the front lines working with people that can make just as big a difference as large, complex, bureaucratic solutions. We see that in so many, so many examples. The number one indicator of whether children learn to read early and how they do in school isn't socioeconomic status, it isn't income, it isn't even surprisingly necessarily standardized test scores. Are there books in the home? Put books in the home, good things start to happen. After the tragedy of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, an interesting thing people found is the greatest difference between those who made it out on time and those who didn't wasn't income, it was social connections. If you had more than five close friends, chances are you had somebody who could put you in touch with who had everything else followed, who has a ride who can get me to the bus station, who can tell me what to do, who's heard the latest government information I might have missed. Those little things, social connections, intellectual stimulation, somebody who cares enough with an encouraging word or even a puppy, those are often the things that make just as much a diff of a difference in the quality of life for people who need it. And that's really where innovation comes in. I was always struck when I was Minister of Education that we actually had a project somewhat similar to the Healthy Seniors Program called the Innovation Fund, which would fund teachers who did interesting things because the idea was solutions aren't necessarily going to come from three people in an office as much as encouraging people on the front lines to come up with great ideas and share them. One of the most powerful things for turning around Teenage boys who struggle to read apparently is comic books. Somebody came into a school and said, you know, if we find people who struggle to read, have artists work with them to create their own comic book character and build a comic book around them. And apparently it gets teenage boys who do want to do very little else to be suddenly interested in the power of words and the magic of language. So, I'm a big fan of what I've seen so far. And one reason I was excited to take this invitation is to encourage this idea of innovation, but innovation doesn't necessarily mean working in a laboratory or coming up with something large scale. It can sometimes be as simple as finding that one tiny innovation that leads to everything else. That if we increase people's social connections, their access to information, 
their access to daily exercise, their access to somebody who cares about them, the supports they need to stay at home, we often unleash the full power of the potential of the individual to do the rest themselves. And that's why events like this are so important to find what works on the front lines, scale it, share it, talk about it with passion. We hear a lot about this, but it is absolutely true that we will have a demographic challenge that by 2050, we will go from 12% of the Canadian population being over 60 to 22%, which I guess makes sense because I, I know I, that includes me now, me and the rest of the Ferris Bueller generation. I, I struggle with that. I keep watching movies with my kids and I keep realizing how old I am. The other day, we, we often have watched movies from dad's youth nights with the kids. We were watching Back to the Future and the critical event where he, his girlfriend writes her number down on the ad to save the old church and hands it to her. And my son turned to me and said, he doesn't have her cell phone number. <laughs> Shut up, kid. Uh, that's not a challenge that is necessarily going to be wrapped up in the offices. We won't solve it all through building more institutional care. That's part of it, but we won't solve it all that way. We won't solve it all by coming up with new income tests and means tests. We'll solve it by encouraging independence and quality of life and dignity for as long as we possibly can and finding the little human touches that prolong that independence and quality of life for all of us as we age. And that means thinking about aging in a new way, doesn't it? One thing we so important to do, and it's funny, as I was mentioning this the other day to my dad, he reminded me of this, that it is important never to reduce aging and the life of seniors down to a function of care. Too often when we talk about seniors issues, we reduce it to healthcare and institutional care like nursing homes and special care homes, instead of looking like full develop and look the full development and the range of the human experience. We used to do that with young children too, by the way. You know, 40 years ago, there was a real debate over whether you should read and talk to your kids when they're little and can't talk back. People said, oh, well, you know, there's no point, they're passive. And sometimes seeing people at a different point in the age spectrum as passive recipients of care can actually blind us to the very real things that are going on beneath. I got very interested in children's development. I remember this point was brought home to me. I had heard it, but I remember once driving with my daughter Kaylee when she was just short of two years old and she was in her car seat. And we pulled up at a toll booth on the Wentworth, in, in the Wentworth stretch there in Nova Scotia. And she's sitting passively in her car seat. You wouldn't think there was anything going on. We pulled up at the window. The fellow opened the window. I handed him money. He took the money. He gave me change. I drove away. Thought, you know, nothing there was remarkable, right? Suddenly we heard a little voice from the back seat, desperately holding out her outstretched hands and saying, Timbit! It's cute, <laughs> but telling, isn't it? Think of everything that's going on and being observed when we see a tiny infant in, a back, in the back seat. And what's really happening is they are taking observations, noting similarities, applying them to new information and drawing conclusions. That, it's scientific method. Except we had to go get her a Timbit because she was really ticked off. <laughs> We can't reduce people to passive recipients of care just because they're at a different point in the aging spectrum. And that is just as important as I am reminded by my dad often at the other end of the aging spectrum, that we need to make sure that in innovation for seniors, we can take into account the full breadth of the human experience and what we need to be fully human in our community surrounded by others who care about us. In that challenge, government should steer, but they shouldn't row. By that, I mean government does some things well. They equalize income. They provide access to programs. They build common infrastructure. They don't innovate so well. They don't deal with changes very well. 
Very often, anyone who works on the front lines with any group who need who relies on government will often be frustrated by a rule that may make sense for a broad outcome, but doesn't make any sense for the issue in front of you. And so building that culture of innovation around aging, valuing and verifying, validating the experience of people on the front lines who know what intervention makes a difference at a right time, when a kind word matters. They know the value of access to daily exercise and recreation to put off institutional care, who know the value of social connection, who know very often it's a few small things of support that allow somebody to stay in their home and in their community where they feel fully part of the world around them, that know that connections with younger people and sharing their stories like some of the projects we're seeing with First Nations elders of still being able to contribute to the cultural conversation, prolong some, not just the quality of life, but life itself because relevance and having something to say is part of the human experience. And so what I want to do, if I can take it, if you take anything away from this brief talk this morning, which is given by somebody who knows only a fraction of what folks with these displays and these projects knows, is that you're doing the right thing. That the folks on the local front lines who know when a little information goes a long way, who knows that monitoring early can prevent disease later on, who knows the value of checking in on somebody, who knows the value of making sure that we still see our peers every day, who knows the value that even though as we slow down and we get a little better and we're not LeBron James and still having access to recreation with people who are going through the same experiences, all those things matter so much that in the end, in the end, one of the most important things any of us can do is give assurance to those of us who, to not only those who are advanced in years, but all of us who inevitably hope to be, that as you age, you will still be independent and relevant. That you will have the autonomy to manage your life, to control your surroundings. That you will still be able to reach out and see people around you. And as you look at things today, I hope that we can all, I, I expect I'm preaching to the choir, but I say it because I want you to know it's a message I, I take when I watch these projects, that we need to see the demographic changes we are facing not as a burden to be born, but hopefully as an opportunity to be embraced. That to become excellent in building communities that allow for healthy aging isn't just something we do because of a financial imperative or because we have to, well, reluctantly, I guess we'd better do it or taxes will go up. It is in fact a challenge to make New Brunswick truly one of the best places to live. It makes sense economically to keep seniors in their community participating, being part of our community, attracting seniors who want to live here and enjoy all the beauty and all the things we know we love about our communities. But it also makes sense on a very basic human level. What better thing can there be for those of us who choose to live here in New Brunswick and love it than to know that each and every one of us can be fully human and independent and autonomous as we all inevitably age. It's great work. I look forward to learning about it. I wanna salute the work of all those who work on things like the Healthy Seniors Project, all of those who have applied their passion to getting those grants, all of those who do community work. I hope you have a great time learning from each other and just know that the desire to be innovative and compassionate makes a difference. Thank you very much and have a great conference. Morning, everyone. My name is Tom Noseworthy. Uh, I'm a board member of Canadian Family Network and I wanna thank Kelly for an inspiring presentation. Uh, I can't resist just looking at you. I'm suffering from a Zoom overdose uh, now. Um, it's characterized by it's sort of a clinical and social syndrome where I have periods of disconnection. I get distracted by 
almost anything in my environment. I have somnolence and low mood, but the treatment is here in front of us. Thank God that we're here. And Kelly, thank you for a, a wonderful um, talk today and getting us started. Um, one of the things that strikes me about the role that you play here um, is the fact that we don't have it in most other parts of the country. What's with all the provinces and territories that don't have a seniors advocate? So I don't know how many we actually have in the country, but I know we don't have them in every province and territory. And I just know from the one province I'm in in BC that the seniors advocate there is a critically important um, instrument of policy change and uses information and data and things that are actually happening practically in the environment to instigate change, even though, let's face it, the seniors advocate doesn't have power and forces and resources. It's the power of influence to do the right thing. So thank you so much for helping us get started. Uh, and we're gonna now move into a very interesting uh, quick session of uh, five presentations, each 10 minutes. And I'll be sitting there with a hook, so it will be 10 minutes. Um, as you know, the AVOID program is being central to the way Canadian Frailty Network thinks and acts, and the A is the activity part. And we all know, you don't need to hear from someone like me how important activity is. But I'm, I'm still impressed uh, as the science develops just how much activity can have a critically important impact on our cognition, our brain, blood flow, and what have you. So keeping active is clearly one of the most important things that you can do for yourself. You don't have to get anybody else to help you with it. Just staying active is likely the most important contribution you can make to your own health and your own cognition. So like, why not? Well, to help us with it, we're gonna have these five presentations. And um, as I said, 10 minutes each. Um, Danielle Bouchard is going to talk to us about Zoomers uh, on the go. I didn't know what a Zoomer was up till two years ago when we found out that Zoomers were really boomers with zip. And we have Robin Polk and Lisa Curtis are gonna to talk to us about innovative pulmonary rehabilitation uh, for seniors in New Brunswick. Tracy uh, Rickards and Mona Green will talk about the Mobile Seniors Wellness Network. Grant Handrigan will talk about STAND, if you can. I presume that has to do with the fact that we are two-legged, not four. And then finally, Martin Senecal will talk about the Van Frail Study, which is a provincial intervention that uh, deals with diabetes and frailty. So five, 10 minutes, uh, you've heard who they all are. They can quickly introduce themselves as they stand here. And I'm gonna start with Daniel and uh, the clock is on. Daniel, where are you? There you are. I better get going then. Um, my name is Danielle Bouchard. I'm a prof at UND in kinesiology. Uh, I don't know about you this morning, but I was happy to find my working clothes. And I was also happy to see that I was still fitting in it. Um, I'm going to uh, talk to you about a program that's called Zoomers on the Go. And one of the reasons why it was successful is because we took every opportunity we had to make it successful. Every time we have a chance, we take it. And one of the chants that I was offered this morning is one of my leaders that is here, because uh, it's a peer leader program, offered to offer, uh, offered to offer, a lot of offering, but uh, to deliver a class outside as, so for you to have a peek of what this program is. So at 12.35, you can meet Jane, Jane, you can raise your hand at the front entry and she will show you what the program is about in the front lawn by up the river. Okay, I'm going to try to get this going. Okay, so what is the problem? There's many problems. We'll talk about a lot of gaps, a lot of issues uh, today, but one of the problems that we wanted to address is the fact that we're uh, having a population that's aging. And uh, one of the main reasons why older adults uh, show up at the hospital or supplies is uh, because of a fall. One person out of three that will go to the hospital and fall because of a fall will not return home. So it's really an issue and it affects the health care costs but most importantly, it affects the uh, quality of life of older adults. How we address this? Uh, we address it by um, uh, doing exercise. 
there's many ways you can do exercise. And one way that we, um, I mean, I say we, but was developed in New Brunswick before I was there is uh, Zoomers on the go. And of all, everything we can do for falls, so you can remove your rugs, you can have better like seeing, like a sighting, like you can have better uh, vision. Everything that you can think about, there's many strategies, but the one that is the single one that is most uh, effective is exercising. And not only exercising like anything you can do, we now know that challenging your balance is the best way to do exercise and it can reduce up to like 51% your risk of uh, falling. So that's what we do in Zoomers on the go. It started before, uh, in 2009 it started, and uh, it was located in, in St. John, New Brunswick. Horizon Health was taking over and they had consultation with occupational therapists, the community, everyone was involved. And they came up with the idea that we should have like an exercise program that is led by older adults in their community, free for everybody. So um, it was in St. John, as I said, it was offered twice a week. Uh, for six minutes each time. It was offered um, for 12 week bouts, but whenever there was funding. So that was a big thing. And then uh, it was an overall fitness uh, program at the time. And it was offered to 50 and up uh, with the idea that we would want to prevent and not just have people that had issues with falls. It was um, managed by Horizon Health and the evidence was collected whenever they had a chance. It was not a research study. So like some people would have data, but it would be like, well, we'll test you when you have a chance. So it's most like, more like mostly to motivate people. They had 918 people in, uh, by the time I came in. They knocked on my door at some point and they said, you know what? I, I heard you know a bit about exercise in older adults. Uh, is this program a good program? And I said, well, what's your goal? And they said, reduce falls. Do you reduce falls? We don't know. Uh, people are showing up. They like it. I mean, this is good for you, but that won't make any money coming in. So let's work together and have this going. We did an RCT, randomized controlled trial, to like uh, show the effectiveness. And then because it was effective, we made it like across Canada with the help of ALT, um, the HSPP. So uh, what we did after is we spread across the province. If you concentrate your uh, attention on, I'll try to do this uh, here, uh, on the map, the purple color is representing uh, where we have participants and leaders right now. We have about 52 leaders right now in the, in the province, both in French and English. And then we have uh, the leaders are the green space, meaning that they are going to some location to do their uh, training. And then we, the black spot is the, the, one of the opportunities that we took over in the last couple of years. We went and offered this program online. We thought it was going to be a patch. We thought that people would do like the, the exercise online because of COVID. Now that uh, COVID is going away, uh, leaders are asking us to still do online and participants are asking us to be online. Right now we have, I look at the number yesterday, 460 people in a, in a low time, like if, uh, spring is not a, a high season for exercise inside, and uh, a third of them are online because they want to be online. But even if they don't want to be online, I mean, I mean, it's not available like in places like here, like you can see that we have a gap, like we don't have leaders in that uh, East Coast, and we're working really hard to figure out like, why we don't have those uh, leaders there and how to change this. So we created some evidence that this was good. We also like one of the good thing about this program is we collect Medicare and Medicare is always like a, a, a click to say we can match this person with a Medicare number, meaning that we can see with Zoomers when they do Zoomers versus when they don't zo do Zoomers over a long period of time. Do they show up at the hospital? Do they get institutionalized? Do they fall? And that's really an important efficacy uh, data. So we have about 2000 people that had access to the program. Uh, uh, since we started uh, to spread it. This is great, but New Brunswick is a small part of the country, so we want to go further than this. What we learned, we learned that uh, people really like it. They like it when it's online. They like it when it's in person. They like the idea that it's free. They like the fact that it's uh, given by not a, a student. And like what they say is it's, it's not given by someone linear in spandex. That's what they like about it. Um, so they look like me, that's what they say. It's, it's free, it's online, all things that we got. What we learn on the scientific side of things uh, is that when we offer online, people show up more often than when we offer in person, probably tackling like barriers like uh, um, transportation, for example. Uh, we also were able to show that we are increasing the uh, literacy, internet literacy 
by participating in our program? Is it our program that makes them more literate or is it because of COVID they became more literate and they can't come to our program? Not too sure, but it's a benefit. What we found uh, on the in-person side of things, when they come, uh, if they come, they drop out less because they're kind of accountable a bit more than when they are in online. And the social piece obviously is better in person, which you can try as much as we can, but the screen is not really friendly. Um, so in the middle though, a lot of outcomes, a lot of benefits are shared between offering online and in person. So um, people enjoy it, they have interests, uh, they have perceived health benefits, and they also reduce all of them, reduce their fall risk, which is our main outcome. So this is all great and it tells us in the future we need to st stay hybrid, uh, meaning online and in person. So what we don't know, we don't know long-term benefits, we don't know if it could be sustained. Uh, we, uh, so now it's nice, we have money. We rip off the money and see if this program really stands by itself. We're there now. Uh, how can we make our model replicated elsewhere? So the next step for this is we're trying to go uh, Canadian-wide and also like internationally. Uh, and that's what we're, uh, we're always seeking money for this. And I'm sure there's money sitting at the table today so you can find me. Um, so what we want to do is access it. We want to give access. We can give access online to anybody starting, like our goal is to start um, in, in, in 2023 access online everybody in those countries can have access we offer it in french and english it's already been done uh sustain we want to sustain in new brunswick we want to learn from new brunswick and then use the data that we got here because if it works in new brunswick if it, it can work anywhere else i'm sure of that uh we want to spread it so we want to spread it where communities don't have a uh, fall prevention program we well, got to learn that in Nova scotia it's hard in pi it's hard in some remote area it's hard so we want to spread it uh, if there's a need but you're sitting there and you're saying like this program is really similar than other programs that exist in ontario and quebec and the pa for example uh the stand if you can uh there's many many programs that exist so what we want to do with those programs is not saying like our Zoomers um, program is the way to go. You should shut down your program and try this one. What we want to say is how can we make your program um, evidence-based? Because even though they say, like Zoomers said years ago, um, we are reducing the risk of falls, most of them never tested it. And most of them, when you look at uh, the guidelines to reduce your risk of falls, is you need to do exercise three hours a week. It needs to be offered all year long, and it needs to be um, a challenging balance. And when we did the stat across Canada, 6% of programs that are available are meeting those guidelines. So we have a lot of will, a lot of money put into fall prevention, but we can do better. And that's what we're going to try with CIHR uh, funding that we're going to be able to attract. Um, so if you want to be involved, this is going to move on with sustainability, regardless if we have funding or not, because we were able to partner with, I see some people around, uh, Trauma New Brunswick, we see um, NBHRF, we have funding from the uh, government, so we're going to continue this in New Brunswick. You want to become a leader, participant, uh, not sure where to start, we do have like um, uh, Jane that will give the class today if you want to peek. And also we are, this is like the map of something that's called Zoom in the Sun. We're going to all those communities between May 30 and June 17. You can find all that information on our Facebook page uh, and uh, get uh, involved that way. That was a race. Thank you for everybody. This program would not be possible without leaders. The key is leaders and the second key is um, participants and obviously all the community partners and funding. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Robin and this is Lisa. It's so nice to see all of you. We'd first like to thank our partners at the Healthy Seniors Pilot Project, New Brunswick Community College, the University of New Brunswick, and the University of Manitoba for all of their help in making this research project a success so far. It takes a real team of experts and proper funding to get a project like this up and running without even looking around the room. I can say with confidence that everyone here knows someone affected by COPD. It could be your parent, your grandparent, 
your aunt or uncle, cousin, neighbor, could even be yourself. I can say that with such confidence because one in five seniors in New Brunswick has been diagnosed with COPD. COPD stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And it's a long lasting lung condition that makes it really hard to get air into and out of the lungs. You might also recognize it as being called emphysema or chronic bronchitis. In New Brunswick, it's a leading cause of hospitalizations next to childbirth. And it costs the province a whopping $23 million a year. For people living with COPD, there's no cure. All a person can do is try to improve the lifelong shortness of breath and other symptoms that are experienced with this lung disease. There's only two real treatments available. There's pharmaceuticals like puffers, and then there's pulmonary, pulmonary rehabilitation. Pulmonary rehabilitation is an exercise and education-based program with the goal of improving quality of life and reducing emergency room visits and hospital admissions. We found with this treatment, it is possible to achieve some level of normalcy. In our program, patients sign up for a course offered three times a week for eight weeks. We work with the patients to educate them on their disease and provide a basic exercise program to help them gain strength and stamina. By learning how to properly manage their disease, quality of life is improved and hospital admissions are reduced. Although pulmonary rehabilitation is considered the standard in care for people living with COPD, less than 1% of people with COPD in Canada have access to it. Some of the reasons that people are not able to access pulmonary re rehabilitation are, most clinics are located in hospitals, in cities where gym space is limited, clinic times are limited, and parking is often a nightmare. There's a lack of healthcare professionals trained in delivering pulmonary rehabilitation. And in New Brunswick, there are many people living in rural areas. Driving three times a week for eight weeks to come to a program in the city is a big commitment as far as costs and time and gas costs and everything like that. So the real question is, what are we doing to help get this needed treatment to more people? What we've done is take pulmonary rehab out of the hospital and set it up in the community. We have offered programs at NBCC's Allied Health Education Centre on the UNB campus in St. John, and we're about to start a clinic at the Garcelon Civic Centre in St. Stephen. St. Stephen was identified as a community in need of pulmonary rehab because participants were not able to commit to traveling more than 100 kilometers each way to receive this important care. If we achieve our goal of permanent funding, we could offer programs in many rural areas, as well as urban centers. We want pulmonary rehabilitation to be easily accessible to everyone who needs it. Another way our program is unique is that we involve healthcare students in delivering education and exercise to our participants. The program is incorporated into the clinical schedule of students in their final year of health-related studies and it allows them to get hands-on experience working with people with COPD. Our participants really love the individualized attention and the youthful energy they receive from the students. Although not all the data has been collected or analyzed to date, all our participants have noted improvements in their quality of life. They now have the breath to go grocery shopping, clean their homes, go bowling, play with their grandchildren, they're able to be more socially engaged, which improves their mood and overall quality of life. Once the data is analyzed, our hope is we'll see a decrease in emer emergency room visits, hospital admissions, and overall length of stay. And in the end, we expect to show significant savings in healthcare costs. In working with these seniors, you can see the transformation happen before your eyes. Participants really do get a new lease on life and although it may seem small to you, some of the big milestones that we've seen are being able to walk around the mall for the first time in 10 years, being able to go to the store for dog food without asking for help, 
being able to carry on a long phone conversation with an old friend, being able to carry groceries, dance with friends, walk to get the mail. One participant was able to use breathing techniques learned in class to improve her shortness of breath and avoid calling an ambulance. And while these may not seem like great feats to seniors living with COPD, these accomplishments can mean the world. One of our participants told us she was going to have to sell her house because she was unable to go up and down the stairs because she was having too much shortness of breath. By the end of the session, she was able to go up and down without problems and decided to stay in her family home. And then another participant wrote this for us to read to, for us to, read to you all. My name, is, my name is Michelle. I was enrolled in the fall session of 2021. When I began pulmonary rehab, I barely made it from handicap par parking to the front door. Upon completion, I could do a couple hours of working out, drive back to Sussex, then continue on with my afternoon activities, something I hadn't been able to do in years. Pulmonary rehab gave me and every participant keys to a successful energetic future. I was taught what COPD is, COPD is and how to ease future attacks, how my medications work and how to take them effectively, and exercise became enjoyment and fun. Before pulmonary rehab, I had no life, but worse, I had no hope. Today, I overcame COVID-19, a harsh winter, and now have the ability to have a full, fun life with friends and family. By applying what I learned daily, my life is fantastic. I am forever grateful, Michelle. And Michelle's is just one of many stories we've heard about from pulmonary rehab. It truly is amazing. Thank you for letting us speak today. I'd love to be able to take that off. So thanks everybody for inviting us and what an exciting day this is. Um, so many people together. It's actually almost a little sort of unnerving to see so many people in the same place at the same time. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the Mobile Seniors Wellness Network. And I think we were slotted into this time frame because we had the word mobile, but it's not about the seniors necessarily being mobile as much as it is about the caregivers being mobile. So the purpose of our, um, research was um, to look at, you know, can we, can we use a really old fashioned way of providing health care and support um, in an innovative way to support seniors to age in place? Does that work? Does that work? There we go. So we, our research question was pretty straightforward. Does a mobile person-centered approach to services and foot care for seniors support safe, safe aging in place and quality of life for isolated seniors? So research shows a direct correlation between seniors um, who report isolation in their home or community with decreased life expectancy, cognitive decline, and diminished quality of life. We enrolled 241 people so far, we're still going, over the age of 55 years, uh, living within an hour's drive of Fredericton uh, into this intervention study. So the team consists of three foot care trained registered nurses, three social workers, an occupational therapist, a research assistant, an admin assistant, a, a project coordinator, and me, the PI. We were also really fortunate to be able to partner with Dr. Karen Cross, who is a plastic surgeon out of Toronto, um, who designed a very, really cool, neat, innovative technology called the Mimosa Scanner. How can you hate something called a Mimosa Scanner, <laughs> right? So the Mimosa Scanner takes infrared images of seniors' feet, um, and the scanner can alert us to peripheral vascular flow issues before the tissue breaks down. Uh, and before we see it with our eyes. Um, we, we, what we did was we compared the Mimosa scanner to the 60 second in low foot 
assessment tool, which is kind of the gold standard foot assessment tool, looking at ease of use and at the sensitivity of the two tools. The RNs made, uh, the nurses made six foot care visits to the participants uh, over a period of, well, it depends on how far apart the foot care visits were, but about six months. Um, and the social workers made at least three visits, depending upon the needs of the seniors. Um, and both the registered nurses and the social workers gathered data using validated tools that assessed frailty, loneliness, social isolation, quality of life um, as, as examples. So what we wanted to determine was how the cost of home visits by registered nurses and social workers support aging in place compared to the cost, both financial and emotional, of living in a long-term care facility or having to leave your home. We also want to know if supports provided by nurses and social workers make a difference in frailty, loneliness, and social isolation. So I'm gonna pass it over to Mona Green, who's one of our social workers and a researcher with me on the project, and she'll explain some of the preliminary findings. I'm just gonna talk about some of the things that we've been doing, what we've been finding as we've been visiting the uh, participants, seniors. Um, one of the most common needs that we seem to be finding is the need for home support services. A lot of seniors need things, like they say they need like light housekeeping, meal preparation, laundry, help getting groceries, maybe help getting to appointments and getting their medications. Um, but the, the process to get this is really complicated and daunting. So first thing we do when we help them get through the process of applying for this. Um, so unfortunately, sometimes even after all the paperwork is done, they get denied the services for several reasons, um, policies. So that's the biggest one that people want. They just, they don't want the personal care. They just mainly want the housekeeping. Um, and then um, a lot of our, our participants are diabetic. We're getting a lot of questions to see if we can help supply them with some uh, glucose monitors or strips, but unfortunately they're not covered. We, we've not been very successful in finding that. Um, even if they're on the Senior Blue Cross, they have trouble getting that because they only cover a very limited portion. Um, another big one that we get is that um, needs for hearing aids. And unfortunately, we haven't had much, much success with that either. And again, a lot of paperwork through social development, long-term care. Um, we're still working on that. Um, but so far, as far as I know, we haven't had much success with that. Um, when we we're talking about people who live in their own homes, there's two categories, some who are renting and some who actually own their own homes. The ones that own their own houses, what the biggest find, the need that we're finding is shoveling and yard work. We're having a really hard time finding people that can do this or will do this, especially at a cost that's affordable to our seniors. Um, and other things people may need in their own home, they need uh, maintenance, upkeep, repair, maybe some adaptations to get uh, ramps and stuff installed. Um, getting this is a real large, a long process as well through social development, um, paperwork and whatnot. Just the application itself is really long. We've helped several people apply. Some have been successful, some not so successful. Um, one person, we actually got them an oil tank, which is great. Um, another person, we actually got them a, a stand-up shower, no cost to them, so we got the grant. Um, other people are just in the process of getting the loan for electrical up, upkeep and, and repair. We've got one so far. Um, oh, another uh, big need around safety, frailty. We have our occupational therapist on, on board. We have a lot of people that are getting help getting grab bars in their washrooms, uh, raised toilet seats, um, seats in their bathtub, that sort of thing. And we've been really successful with that, as well as getting some people some walkers and canes. Um, and a lot of people we've helped get lifelines installed as well. And we try to point out if someone's living alone, we try to like encourage them to get that because if they fall or something, that way they can get help. Um, now for the people who don't own their own homes and are renting, as we all know, if we're watching the news, there's a lot of rent evictions happening. Um, a few of our participants were victims of that. 
we were successful in getting housing for a couple, maybe three people in getting housing. Um, it wasn't easy, it was a challenge. Um, another part is transportation. Even though we have a bus system in the city, it's not always really good for people with mobility issues. So things like trying to get on the bus and bring the groceries home or, or you know, managing it in the winter time. So we've reached out to an organization, um, Adopt a Grandparent, and we, they have volunteers. We set them up with our people and they help get them to air, like for groceries and errands and things like that, or maybe just company. Um, another big one is that uh, people are really lonely. Um, a lot of people live by themselves and Sometimes I think, geez, we're not doing anything. Sometimes we go to their houses and we're not really doing anything. We're doing the, the questionnaires and whatnot. And I'm thinking, we're not doing anything. And then one of my colleagues pointed out, we are. Because they've said to us right out, they've said, just you being here helps. Because sometimes you are the only people we see in the run of a week or a month or whatever. We're the only people that visit, especially during COVID. So our role is pretty important, more important than I even thought. Um, and we also offer a little bit of mental health support or grief support. Um, we've got a lot of people connected with Meals on Wheels. A lot of people um, have, uh, oh, the food bank. I, we've connected a lot of people with the food bank and got them set up with food delivery. We've helped people um, oh, for information but for low income benefits, um, where they can go to get their taxes done for free, how to apply for a widow's allowance, information on special care homes. I mean, the list goes on and on. So that's the sort of things we've been doing. And like I said, there are some we've been successful with and others we've uh, been presented with a few challenges. So thank you. Not done. <laughs> In terms of the future, we believe that aging is really a privilege um, and that seniors should be afforded all the dignity in the world. Uh, we feel that our project has shown great promise in supporting people to age in place. And as Kelly Lamrock just said, it's really not the big things. It's the little things that, ha that are really making the difference. Um, as things like you know, creating social connections for people, um, access to resources, uh, identifying some of the needs that they have, Thank you. Uh, respecting their dignity. Um, visiting nurses and social workers should be permanently funded program and which is viable and cost effective way of supporting seniors as they age. And we believe that running our program is in fact less expensive than having people stay in long term care facilities. Um, and as I've mentioned before, it's less expensive emotionally as well. So thank you very much for your time this morning and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the showcase and please stop by our booth. We'd love to answer any questions. Okay. All right. So good morning, every, everyone. Um, before I start the presentation, I'd like to ask everybody, if you're able to, to just stand up for a, a brief second, stretch out a little bit. And what you just did, if you wanted to, and you're able to, is what it's at uh, the heart of the project that I'm going to be talking about for the next 10 minutes or so. So uh, you can stay standing, of course, if you want. You can walk, you can leave, or you can uh, take your seats. But um, the project that I'm presenting today is called the uh, Stand If You Can, Tenez-vous debout si vous pouvez research project. It's a project uh, that uh, involves many collaborators and um, funded by the Canadian Frailty Network and the... Um, New Brunswick Health Research Foundation. So it's an honor to be here this morning to be able to present this project and share some of the results and our experiences. So like I said, it's a project that was run collaboratively with uh, the University of Moncton, St. Thomas University and uh, Linda Casey at St. Thomas University and Danielle Bouchard at uh, UNB uh, with other members that were participating, including uh, many students who had the opportunity to spend some time um, 
22 weeks actually in uh, older um, care or long-term care facilities, nursing homes here in New Brunswick. Which click, that's not clicking. There you go, thanks. So um, the uh, framework for this uh, project, there's many different lenses you can take about getting people active. And the, the, uh, the approach that we took was to break up sedentary time. So to try and have individuals uh, break up the sedentary time because we know that older adults in long-term care facilities uh, spend uh, a significant amount of time in uh, sedentary positions. So uh, there's different types of activities, intensities, of course. And like I said, this activity uh, we focused on for the intervention was to use um, a relatively easy activity to break up sedentary time, which was uh, standing up. Am, am I controlling the slides or is somebody else controlling the slides? <laughs> um, so the, whoever it is, you're doing a good job, so keep it up. Um, the data uh, that's on the slide here now is from a pilot study that uh, Danielle Bouchard led uh, that I wasn't involved in. And in this project, it was uh, the test out, um, I guess, offering an exercise intervention in older or a physical activity or a sedentary reduction uh, program in older and long-term care facilities uh, to just to see what types of um, interest and what is feasible. So. Um, to try and identify different days that the sessions, the standing sessions. So it was an individual program that uh, older adults were matched up with um, research assistants who uh, invited uh, the, the residents to stand up. So we were able through that, uh, Danielle and her team were able to identify the days of the week and the times of the days that... Uh, whoever's controlling the slide. Which one is that? Uh, I can guarantee you I'm pressing pretty firmly here. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so uh, we were able, they were able to identify the different days that, uh, and times of the day for the intervention, which led us to the research questions that are at the heart of this project. So uh, what we're wondering before we start the intervention was, does standing 100 minutes uh, per week lead to an improvement in gait speed? Gate speed was the primary outcome. Um, does standing 100 minutes per week reduce falls risk uh, as a secondary analysis? And what type of experiences uh, did the residents perceive uh, towards the intervention? So how was their um, uh, perception of uh, their participation? Firmly pressing. <laughs> <clears throat> to get to the methodology, uh, it was a... Um, randomized control trial with uh, multiple sites. So we had uh, half of the team located here in Fredericton and the other half of the team were located in Moncton. Uh, four uh, nursing homes or long-term care facilities participated. Um, we did a pre-evaluation um, of the participants with a bunch of different domains and factors that I'll show shortly. And then uh, the intervention was uh, individuals are randomized either to a social intervention or control intervention where the participants uh, received daily visits uh, without any encouragement to stand. And the intervention, the active arm or the experimental group, uh, individuals received daily visits during 22 weeks and were invited to stand for up to 20 minutes a day. So five days a week, 20 minutes is 100 minutes. Uh, we performed many different tests to try and evaluate the benefits of participating and the primary focus was uh, 10 meter gait speed. Gait speed is a strong indicator of abilities, mortality, and, uh, and a bunch of other different factors. So it's, a, it's an easy way to test someone's abilities, but uh, we also tested many other uh, variables. Gait speed was measured over 10 meters. Uh, we only took the time for the middle six meters to allow for an acceleration and a deceleration phase. And I'll just get to right to the results. The participants in total, we had uh, approximately, I think it was 90, that's 44 and 45, 89 participants complete. Um, older adults, uh, no differences between the groups and these were randomized at 